Thank you to Hero Cosmetics for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt. Hey everyone, I need to tell you about Mighty Patch, which is a hydrocolloid acne patch. You know, I've had extra stress in my life lately, and my face has been breaking out more than usual. So you take their Mighty Patch, stick it on your face at night, and when you wake up in the morning, you'll see a reduction with your pimples. When you toss the patch away, you can see the grime and realize that it was doing all of the heavy lifting. Their products are cruelty-free, vegan-friendly, and super gentle on your skin. Check out the products on their website. You'll notice that they have great reviews. If you want to try Mighty Patch for yourself, use code BEYOND15 for 15% off on HeroCosmetics.com. That's B-E-Y-O-N-D-15 for 15% off. This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. We're going to have a little bit of a different episode today. I'm going to talk about four unique stories that geographically span the width of the United States and unravel over several decades. But there are common threads that tie these situations together. We all have a past, and we often tuck it away or close it like a book. For you and me, our past is mostly benign. At least hopefully it is. But for a small group of people... Their past contains atrocious crimes. Crimes that they might have committed decades ago, and they buried all those awful details deep inside themselves. They were never planning on facing up to what they've done. With all the amazing things that can be done with DNA forensics, these individuals are now being caught, 10, 20, or sometimes 30 years later. Their friends and neighbors are in disbelief when these people are finally arrested. Some family members are in deep denial and proclaim that their loved ones are innocent. We have to grapple with the fact that we don't fully own our DNA. We indirectly share it with our relatives. And if they upload their DNA profile to a database like GEDmatch, then that opens a door for all kinds of connections to be made. You're listening to Episode 26, When Our Secrets Intersect with DNA. Our first story takes place in the Midwest. 25-year-old David Schuldes and 24-year-old Ellen Matthews were engaged and met at the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay four years earlier. It was 1976, and they were going to be married at the end of the summer in September. David graduated from Green Bay West High School and worked part-time at the Green Bay Press-Gazette in the circulation department as he attended UWGB. Ellen already graduated from UWGB in 1974 and worked at the campus library in the Technical Services Department. On July 9, in 1976, David and Ellen wanted to go camping for the weekend and headed to the Goodman County Park, but it was full, so they headed to McClintock Park in the town of Silvercliff. There were no other campers there, so they set up their tent and prepared to take a nature walk on a warm, beautiful Wisconsin weekend. The couple stopped at the park's restroom. David was waiting patiently outside, as Ellen used the facility. Out of nowhere, he was shot in the neck by a thirty caliber bullet, and a stray shot hit the restroom wall. No one was sure if Ellen ran out of the bathroom or if she was ordered out. She was pulled into a grouping of trees where she was sexually assaulted. As Ellen was putting on her clothes, she was shot twice in the chest with the same thirty caliber rifle. A county parks employee was restocking firewood when he happened upon David's body. The employee stopped the first motorist that he could find, and it was an off-duty officer from Marinette. The officer stayed with the body while the parks worker dialed the police. After officers investigated the crime scene, they realized that there was likely a woman missing who had been camping with David. They searched for her until the sun went down, but they found nothing. The next day, the search was expanded, and they eventually discovered Ellen's body. 
police found semen on her shorts and sent the sample to the crime lab. There wasn't a lot that was done with DNA in the 1970s, but they kept the sample preserved for evidence. Witnesses had seen a man carrying a gun to his vehicle around the time of the shootings, and a composite sketch was created. During the investigation, they realized that two nights prior to the murders, two police officers and their wives camped in the same area. They were all sitting around the fire at their campsite, and they noticed that a man was watching them from the woods. One officer went to his camper to retrieve his gun, but by the time he returned, the man in the woods disappeared. They felt that the mystery man in the woods matched the composite sketch that was drawn. The killer had taken no money, so it seemed that the crime was sexually motivated. He disappeared and was never caught. Months after the crime, campers understandably avoided McClintock Park. Investigators never matched the suspect's DNA to anyone from the CODIS database, even when DNA testing became prominent in the 1990s. In March 2018, the Marinette County Sheriff's Office wanted this crime solved, so they contacted Parabon Nanolabs. As many of you already know, Parabon Nanolabs is well known for their specialization in DNA forensics. Parabon received the sample in April 2018, and by December 21, 2018, they narrowed the perpetrator down to a pool of suspects from a specific family from the Green Bay, Wisconsin area. The parents had four sons, and Parabon believed that the killer was one of the four sons or one of the four grandsons. Parabon created a picture called Snapshot Phenotyping, which created a portrait of what the suspect looked like in 1976, and also a modern-day portrait of what he looked like now. The 1976 snapshot portrait looks similar to the composite sketch that was drawn at the time of the crime. Marinette County investigator Todd Baldwin approached this case systematically. He was going to start with one brother and work his way through the family. He began surveillance on Cornelius Van Evenhoven. Todd took a bag of the suspect's garbage that contained socks, bandages, and an inhaler. DNA analysis quickly ruled Cornelius out. Surveillance began on brother number two, Edward Van Evenhoven. Edward lived next to a retired O'Connell County Sheriff's detective. Edward often stopped at his home, where the two chatted over coffee. The ex-sheriff agreed to have Edward over and kept the used coffee mug for the crime lab. Edward was quickly ruled out by the DNA analysis. Next up was Ray Van Evenhoven. Two officers knocked on Ray's door and had him complete a survey about policing. Ray licked the envelope and handed it over to the officers. In March 2019, they analyzed the saliva at the crime lab, and it was a perfect match for the 1976 crime at McClintock Park. On March 14, 2019, they executed a search warrant on Raymond Van Evenhoven's house. A 30 30 lever action rifle was found in the garage cabinet and there were shell casings in a tin can on a shelf. When Raymond was arrested, he had little reaction. They publicly announced his arrest on March 15, 2019, and it sent ripples through Wisconsin. Many had never heard about this crime since it was 43 years old, and the accused was a man in his 80s. On March 22, 2019, Raymond Van Evenhoven had his first court appearance and the judge set his bail at $1 million. They charged him with two counts of first-degree murder and first-degree sexual assault. The judge asked Van Evenhoven if he understood the charges, and he yelled back at the judge that he was not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. The sexual assault charge was eventually dismissed, as the statute of limitations had run out. On July 1, 2019, Raymond Van Evenhoven pled not guilty to the charges. Kurt Schuldes was a cousin to David, and he was pleased that they arrested the perpetrator. But there was also a sense of loss. The murderer had gotten away with a crime for a long time, and in the meantime lived a full life. Cynthia Chizik was Ellen's niece, 
and not knowing who committed this crime for so long, was hard to contend with. It was difficult knowing that someone who committed such a terrible crime had been out in the world. So who was Raymond L. Van Evenoven? Ray was from Lakewood, Wisconsin, which is a town of 800 people, and is approximately 20 miles from where the murders took place in the town of Silvercliff. Ray was a handyman and was known as Old Ray in Lakewood. He helped repair many items for his neighbors and worked on anything from lawnmowers in the summer to snowblowers in the winter. He married his wife Rita in 1956, and she died in 2008, a few months after their wedding anniversary. They had three daughters and three sons, plus many grandkids and great-grandkids. After Rita's death, Ray spent his time fishing, hunting, and camping. Many people were not aware that Ray had a dark side. In 1957, Ray was 20 and went by the name Lawrence. He would have been newly married to Rita around the time he attacked two different girls. One was 16 and the other 17. The 17-year-old was walking with her two friends when he struck her face, shoulders, and back. They charged Ray with battery, and he went to jail for six months. When he was asked why he did it, Ray said he was only trying to scare the women. A few years later in 1960, Ray pled guilty to and was put on probation for one year for not providing financial support to his wife and their one-year-old daughter. Some of Ray's neighbors witnessed his bad behavior when he was drinking. Freed Mason worked at the town dump and called Ray a real son of a bitch when he drank and said no one wanted to be around him when he was like that. Freed often encountered the less-than-sober Ray when he searched the dump for scrap engine parts. He eventually stopped drinking when he was in his 70s. But after Ray's arrest, neighbors had to admit that they really didn't know him that well. It wasn't even clear where he worked prior to his retirement. Some heard he was an iron worker, and other people thought he used to haul and deliver boats for a living. On March 26, 2020, a judge ruled that Van Evenoven was not competent to stand trial. Legally, this meant he did not understand the court proceedings and could not assist his counsel in his own defense. The psychiatrist who examined Van Evenoven said he had paranoid preoccupations and other deficits that were residual effects of a stroke, but the evaluator thought his competency could be restored. Van Evenoven disagreed with the psychiatrist's diagnosis. Both the prosecutor and the defense agreed that he was not competent for trial. The judge thought the 83-year-old could regain competency by summer, but Van Evenoven refused to cooperate with his evaluators. In the meantime, he is living at a mental health facility. His next status hearing takes place in September 2020. The brother-in-law of Ray's deceased wife, Rita, was convinced of Ray's innocence, despite the DNA evidence. He strongly believed that Ray was a loving father and husband. For our next stories, we are heading out west to Tacoma, Washington, a mid-sized city in Puget Sound. Michelle Welsh was a 12-year-old girl in the sixth grade. She loved music, played the violin, was a talented artist, and enjoyed reading. One of Michelle's younger sisters, nine-year-old Nicole, lovingly described Michelle as a stereotypical bossy sister. On March 26, 1986, at 10 a.m., Michelle and her two younger sisters, Angela and Nicole, and their babysitter, went to Puget Park at the north end of Tacoma. Michelle went back home around 11 a.m. so the babysitter could get lunch made for everyone. Michelle took the lunches back to the park and set them down on a picnic table. She saw her sister's bikes and locked her bike up in the same spot. Michelle didn't realize that her sisters had walked off to use the restroom at a business near the park, so she went looking for them. At 1.15 p.m., her sisters returned to the park and they didn't see Michelle, so they played for a little longer. Thirty minutes later, they looked for Michelle again, and they found the lunch bag was ripped open on the picnic table, but their sister was still missing. The girls headed down a trail to look for their sister, but their babysitter spotted them and called them back. The police were called and started their search for Michelle just after 3 p.m. Hours slipped by, and she had not turned up. 
At 11.30 p.m., an officer's tracking dog finally found Michelle. Her body was discovered close to a ravine in the park, next to a fire pit area. Michelle was sexually assaulted, her neck was cut, and she sustained blunt force trauma to her head. When law enforcement interviewed people who had been in the park, Michelle's classmate had seen a man who had watched the girls from underneath Proctor Bridge, which was on the north side of the park. He was a skinny younger man wearing dirty white shoes, jeans, and a jean jacket with holes. An employee who worked at Michelle's middle school was driving by the park around 1.30 p.m. and had seen Michelle talking with a younger Hispanic man by the gulch where she was found. He had black hair, a mustache, and was wearing lighter color clothing. Shortly after Michelle was found, another young 16-year-old girl was walking on Proctor Bridge when she was grabbed by a man. She was able to evade him and ran towards her friends, who helped scare the man away. When they were interviewed by police, they thought the man was white or Hispanic, smaller with black hair, and was very similar to the description that the employee from Michelle's middle school had provided to the police. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. I wanted to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their licensed professional therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in anxiety, depression, stress, relationships, trauma, grief, or LGBT issues. I work from home and don't often like to leave my house, so I really appreciate that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your home. There's no need to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. You can start talking with your counselor in less than 24 hours. So if you've been thinking about getting counseling, there's never been a better time because listeners will get 10% off their first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Showing over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, That's betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt. Let me tell you about this rad puzzle game. Best Fiends is a game you can play on your phone, and it's enjoyable because you go through all these levels, solving challenging puzzles that actually engage your mind and keep it active. Many of us are seeking out entertainment, and this is the perfect game to fill that need. The cool thing about it is that it doesn't take up much of your time. You can put the game down and easily pick it up later on where you left off. You don't need an internet connection to play, so it's convenient, especially when your internet goes down like mine often does. Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events, so it never gets old. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends, free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, back to the show. Jennifer Bashton was a 13-year-old girl who was training for a bike trip. She was preparing for a tour of the San Juan Islands, which is an archipelago between the state of Washington and Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. Patty Bashton was proud of her daughter's dedication to riding her bike daily to accomplish this goal. Jennifer had just received a new Schwinn 18-speed bike, and she wanted to take it for a spin on the five-mile drive. Five Mile Drive was a trail that ran through Point Defiance Park. The park was a popular Washington attraction with a zoo, aquarium, museum, gardens, and off-leash dog park. The Five Mile Drive Trail catered to hikers, runners, and cyclists. On Saturday and Sunday mornings, the loop was popular enough that it would be closed to motor vehicle traffic. It was also only a few miles away from the location where Michelle Welsh was murdered. On August 4, 1986, Jennifer wrote a note to her parents that said she would be home by 6.30 p.m. A few of Jennifer's classmates saw her riding in the opposite direction around 4.10 p.m. There was a man riding near her, but she didn't appear to be distressed. Sometime between 3 and 5 p.m., two witnesses had spoken with a person who fit Jennifer's description. 
This young lady was enthusiastic about training for an upcoming bike tour. It was now 8.30 p.m., and Jennifer had not returned home. Her parents were quick to report her missing. Law enforcement closed Point Defiance Park and searched for Jennifer for two days. They used tracking dogs and had many people take part in the search and rescue party. The Green River Killer Task Force also joined the efforts since they were experienced in navigating outdoor crime scenes. By August 7th, the park had been thoroughly searched, but Jennifer was not found. On August 26, someone was jogging on the five-mile drive and encountered a potent smell by the cliffs that overlooked the bay. Police found Jennifer there with her bike lane close to her. She had been sexually assaulted, then strangled to death. Since the murders took place close in time and proximity, law enforcement formed a task force. Six people spent over 10,000 hours investigating these two cases for the rest of 1986. There were thousands of tips, but none of them ever materialized into useful information. DNA was collected from Michelle's crime scene, but when they checked it against the CODIS database, there were no matches. The only thing they had were the composite sketches that were created from the witnesses. The community was very concerned with getting these murders solved, and local businesses donated $5,000 as a reward for information. Over the next two decades, police identified several potential suspects in the Tacoma area. Gerald Friend raped and tortured a 12-year-old girl in 1960. He was convicted and sentenced to 75 years in prison. Even though he escaped twice, they paroled him in 1980. In June 1970, he kidnapped a 14-year-old girl near Tacoma as she was leaving a concert. He tortured and raped her in his mobile home, which included hanging her from the ceiling by a pulley system and burning her with a blowtorch. When he took her in his truck to a gas station, the young woman ran away and saved herself. This incident inspired the song Polly, written by Kurt Cobain of Nirvana. A few years went by, and in the summer of 1990, the police explored a new suspect in 36-year-old Michael Sanchez. Michael was a volunteer firefighter and was a respected man in his community until he murdered an 11-year-old girl. He was acquainted with her family and even took part in the search and rescue efforts to find her. Next, police looked into Thai immigrant and Buddhist monk, Terapan and Hanan, who raped a 16-year-old half-sister and served a brief jail sentence. In July 2007, 42-year-old Terrapon took 12-year-old Zika Linick from her backyard, then raped and murdered her. Police could not connect any of these suspects to Michelle or Jennifer, so their cases remained cold. Right after Jennifer's murder, law enforcement could not collect DNA because of the advanced composition of her body. They found her swimsuit around her ankles, so they assumed that there was no DNA on her clothes. In 2013, an expert convinced police to conduct a new DNA test of Jennifer's swimsuit. They discovered usable DNA and found that it differed from the DNA that was found on Michelle Welsh. Until that point, law enforcement had been convinced that their cases were linked because of their similar age, similar location where they were attacked, and similar crimes that were perpetrated against them. But now, this information set officials on an alternative path since the two cases were no longer connected. Police spent the next several years collecting samples from area men who voluntarily gave their DNA to see if they could find answers to the cold cases. In 2016, officials called the Child Abduction Response Team into action and restarted the murder investigation as if the cases were new. They could look at the evidence with fresh eyes and had new technologies at their disposal. Police got Parabon Nanolabs involved in 2018. Parabon uploaded the DNA from Michelle Welsh's case to the GEDmatch, which is an open-source ancestry database. Parabon narrowed Michelle's killer down to two suspects who were brothers. Police followed one brother, 66-year-old Gary Charles Hartman, and collected a discarded napkin he had used during breakfast at a restaurant. His napkin matched the DNA from the crime scene, 
so they arrested him in June 2018. In 1986, Hartman worked as a nurse and lived with his third wife in Lakewood, Washington, less than three miles away from Tacoma. When Hartman was arrested, he was working as a registered nurse at Western State Hospital, which had over 800 psychiatric beds, and he helped patients transition back into society. His work record was perfect, and he never had one complaint filed against him. Hartman's neighbors thought he was an agreeable person who enjoyed typical interests like drinking a beer at a neighbor's home or showing off his vintage car. He never made law enforcement's suspect list back in 1986. They charged Hartman with first-degree murder and first-degree rape. His bail was set at $5 million, and he entered a plea of not guilty. Robert Dwayne Washburn contacted the police back in 1986 and left a tip that he had seen someone jogging in Point Defiance Park who resembled Michelle Walsh's killer. So when police were asking area men for DNA samples, Washburn agreed to this in 2017. By May 2018, police knew he had killed Jennifer Bastian. In January 2019, the 61-year-old pled guilty to first-degree murder and was convicted and sentenced to 26 and a half years in prison. He admitted to pulling Jennifer into the woods and strangling her when he was 28 years old. Washburn only had one blemish on his record when he was arrested in 1985 for vehicular prowling and criminal trespassing, but they never charged him with a crime. His neighbors always thought he was a pleasant guy who kept to himself, but he also helped them with car repairs since he was a mechanic. Washburn married in 1975, but divorced in 1985. In 1990, he married a woman named Cindy Stevens, but they called it quits a few years later. When she found out about his arrest, it was inconsistent with the man she knew. Cindy always thought he was gentle, and he never jogged or was even athletic. Unbeknownst to her, he was routinely jogging through the park when he murdered Jennifer. He only lived two miles away from the crime scene. Since he pled guilty, it spared the Bastion family from having to endure a trial. Lindsay Wade was one detective that helped break the cold cases. She worked on a bill called Jennifer and Michelle's Law that would help expand law enforcement's DNA database by collecting DNA from dead sex offenders and individuals convicted of indecent exposure. The bill was signed into law in May 2019. For our last story, we're heading to the East Coast. James Essel was an immigrant from Ghana. He arrived in the United States in 1959 and opened an African restaurant called Warabata. He enjoyed life in Maryland. There was a tranquility with living in an area so close to the water that it reminded James of ocean life in Ghana. He tired of restaurant life and transitioned into a banking career where he was a branch manager. James made one last career change when he decided to open up a small grocery store called the Sugarloaf Mountain Market in Comus, Maryland. He was an outgoing guy and was popular with the customers who shopped at his store. James was very compassionate and often extended credit to his customers. By this time, he had married, had several children, and divorced. The 57-year-old father was close with his daughter, Raphael, and she often worked in his store. James also told her if she were ever robbed to always turn over the money because it just wasn't worth it. March 22, 1992, was a cold, windy Maryland night. James' daughter, Raphael, was supposed to work in the store that night, but she wasn't feeling well, and the weather was not the best. Her father told her to stay home, and he would run the grocery store. James was the only one working that night. At 6 p.m., a customer walked into the nightmarish scene at the Sugarloaf Mountain Market. He found James lying on the floor behind the checkout area and there was an enormous pool of blood. The customer immediately ran out of the store and called 911. Detectives thought James rang up a customer around 5.30 p.m. and was attacked with a bottle of wine. They thought a knife could have been used in addition to the bottle of wine. James was stabbed 29 times per the autopsy report. The jagged wine bottle was used to cut James in his chest, throat, and back. He had wounds on his hand and elbow from trying to block all the blows he received. 
James fought hard for his life. So hard, in fact, that someone else's blood was found at the crime scene. Law enforcement collected the perpetrator's DNA evidence and compared it to the CODIS database, but there were no matches. At the end of 2018, Maryland investigators contacted Parabon Nanolabs and gave them the perpetrator's DNA. Parabon provided law enforcement with the name of one person. Lucky for Montgomery County, one of their detectives was an amateur genealogist who had practiced this hobby for a long time. He constructed a family tree based on the Parabon information and identified a male who lived in the Maryland or Virginia area during the crime in 1992. Police paid a visit to the man on December 11, 2019, and this person had never been to the Sugarloaf Mountain Market and never met the victim. Police swabbed the suspect, and his DNA did not match. They took this information to Bode Technology, which also has comprehensive DNA forensic services, including forensic genealogy. Bode said the DNA profile didn't match the crime scene, but this person was probably a close relative of the killer. He was the biological father or brother of the perpetrator. With more police work, they figured out the biological father had already passed away. But he had one brother, Hans Alejandro Hewitz. On Monday, February 11, 2020, detectives brought a warrant and headed to the workplace of Hans Hewitz. Detectives swabbed him and sent the sample into the laboratory. The DNA matched the 1992 crime scene and Hewitts would have been 24 years old at the time of the murder. Law enforcement had finally found their perpetrator, after 28 long years. Hewitts avoided the law for so long because he had lived a life free of crime, which is why there was never a DNA match in the CODIS database. Hewitts was an auto mechanic who lived in Virginia Beach on a cul-de-sac close to the ocean, which was just a few hours' drive from the crime scene. He owned a ranch-style house, was married to a retired police officer, and lived an ordinary life. No one in his family had known about his secret. Hewitts had kept it buried after all these years, but that secret was about to be turned loose to the public. Police went to arrest Hewitts on Wednesday, February 12th. The intention was to charge him with first-degree murder, felony murder, and robbery with a dangerous weapon. At 6.30 a.m., the 51-year-old Hewitts, was confronted by law enforcement while he was in his vehicle. They tried to get him to surrender, but he pulled a gun and was shot by individuals from the U.S. Marshals and officers with the Montgomery County, Maryland Police Department. They had worked together on a joint task force to find Hans Hewitts. Bystander William Lips recorded the standoff, and you can find his eight-minute-long video online. Heidi Hewitts was married to Hans for six years and had known him since they were kids. Even though she was a police officer, she was in deep shock over the allegations against her husband. While she offered condolences to the Essel family, she wanted to clear her husband's name, since he had a clean record and had not technically been arrested. She believed in his innocence despite the evidence. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Just a side note, In 2020, GEDmatch, which is the database often used to perform this forensic genealogy work, changed their policy and now require the user to actively opt in to allow law enforcement to use their DNA profile. This will make it more difficult for police, so we might see a slowdown of cases solved by this method. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources used in this episode. This episode was researched by Laura Delgado and me. Script writing, editing, and all audio production were performed by me. Shout out to new patron, Marissa M. I appreciate you. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review in Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone.
Joseph. 